Alright. Good evening. Uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll fall asleep if you don't fall asleep, Dill. Good evening. Alright, now when I study God's Word, I have fun doing what I do. So if you don't have fun tonight, that is not my fault. That is on you, okay? So I want you to know something. Bible study is not laborious. Uh, neither is discussing the things that we're going to discuss this weekend. Uh, because I get pretty passionate about the subject of, of the Lord's church. And I get pretty passionate about the subject of the families within the Lord's church. Because in Kyle Publications, our belief truly is that if the Lord's church is going to become stronger, we say it this way, if the pews are going to become stronger, the homes must become stronger. That's where discipleship is supposed to take place according to Scripture. As a matter of fact, when you look through Scripture, what you find, and we're going to look at that this week, when you dive into God's purpose for the church, you're going to find out that it was never to supplant the discipleship that was supposed to take place at home. That's why we firmly believe that if the church is going to get stronger, then fathers must stand up and lead their homes. We firmly believe if the church is going to get stronger, then mothers must stand up and lead beside her husband, or in some cases where it's a single parent household and maybe she has to wear double double hats or two hats, then she's got to lead. But you see, our, our passion is also for this, that as we continue to raise young people and raise individuals up in a culture that that is steeped in what some have called post postmodernism, which for you young people, what that means is this. There was a time where individuals believed in truth, but we actually live in a time period now where we have an individual who ran for a high office in America and was elected for the highest office in the land who made the statement that we're not interested in facts, we only want truth. I want you kind of to chew on that for just one second. Because if I were to ask you where does truth come from, you would probably say from the facts. But we live in a culture where facts don't dictate truth. Emotions dictate truth. How you feel about something? How you feel about a person? Do I like you or do I not like you? Did you have mean tweets or happy tweets? And that is how I judge whether or not I like what you say and accept what you say. You said, Joe, this is getting pretty close to political. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. I will offend all of you by the time the seminar is over. And then I'm getting on an airplane and leaving. That's how my job works. My job is not to be offensive, and nor is it to go to politics. I, I do not believe that is the position of the pulpit, but I will tell you this right now. You did not bring a man in who's afraid to teach the Bible. I just pray that the Bible is going to make its way into hearts who are ready to receive God's Word. You see, when I come to speak, I pray that the Lord will use me, but I also have been praying for your minds and your hearts. Because here's the deal. I know we all have filters. We all have filters. I don't know your backgrounds. I don't know where you come from. I don't know where your leanings, but the reality is this. Everything that I'm going to say this weekend, you're going to filter through your starting points. And I already know that. And so my desire is not that when you leave, you... You, you think that maybe there was something that I said that was profound. I don't know if anything I'm going to say will be profound. But what I want is this, that at the end of this seminar, you leave saying, you know what? I'm glad that we got together to study God's Word. I'm so grateful that we in a multiple generation concept could come together, that the young could see the older and the older could see the younger, having a desire to grow in a knowledge of God's Word. You see, one of the things that Andy didn't tell you about us is Aaron and I, we also co-direct what is called Legacy Family Camp East. Uh, we've been attending the Legacy Family Camp that takes place. It started in Lone Wolf, Oklahoma. Uh, we've been attending that one for years. Now it's at Petty John Springs uh, in Medill, Oklahoma. Uh, but when we went in to full-time work with Kyle Publications and the seminar speaking, uh, we decided to partner with the, the directors of that camp to start something on the eastern side of the Mississippi. And so Legacy Family Camp East is, is about generational faithfulness. Some of you all are what are called anchor men and anchor women within your families. That means this, you didn't come from a background of, of faithfulness. You didn't have moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas who took you to church or took you to Bible classes. You are that first link in the chain within your family. I, I'm not. I'm not I'm not what's called an anchor man. 
I'm a link in the chain. I come from long lines of elders, deacons. My older brother is an elder up in, in Wisconsin. My father was a gospel preacher for numerous years before he died. I am a link in the chain. I am not an anchor man to the legacy of my family. But I will tell you this, and many of you probably aren't anchor men and women either. I will tell you this, the issue is not am I an anchor or am I a link. The issue is will you be faithful in your time? Will you be faithful in your time? Because that's all God's called you to be. The reality is this, some of you better be faithful because there's a, a legacy, a generation to come concept in your life that if you don't hold fast as the anchor, then the reality is this, the chain has to start all over again. The same can be said for all of us though. If we're links in a chain that breaks with you or it breaks with your children, then somebody's got to start it over again. When I read the book of Judges chapter 2, I'm mindful that we're only one generation away from apostasy. That means this, young people, we are one generation away from falling away and not knowing God. One. That's all. And so what I want to do is I want to look into God's Word and say, what's God's answer for that? Where does He want? Not what do we want. What does He want? And if I can walk away with that, and I do believe that God is all, all authority, and I believe that He knows a whole lot more than I know, then at the end of the day, you know what I'm going to do? What God calls me to do is to have a heart that is submissive to His will. And if at any point in time, I don't like what He says, the problem is not with His Word, the problem is with me. And that's not going to go favorably for me in eternity if I choose to rebel just because it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So yes, when I go speak at places, I pray for hearts and minds that are ready to receive God's Word. Because look, I know it. I used to introduce myself. It's funny because Lacey's here. I've known Lacey since she was a teenager. Didn't even know she was at this congregation. Interviewed her once for my magazine. So I used to speak a lot. I still do. I speak a lot to young people. And young people, by that I mean teenagers, uh, they don't always want the biographical introduction that Amy so eloquently gave other than not Alabama, Tennessee. But we'll forgive you, brother. No balls, not roll tie, okay? But here's the deal. I used to introduce myself as, as three B's. You remember that? The first one is this. There's not a whole lot of pretense with me. My name is Joe or Joseph. We've already had that conversation, right? But I only use Joseph if I get in trouble by my mama when growing up. My wife really wants to get my attention. And you married men know what that means. The idea, though, is this. I am a big man. That's the first B. I've been big all my life. That's just what it is. They used to ask if mom and dad put miracle grow in our, in our oatmeal. I mean, it came back to, to benefit at least one of us. I had a brother who played in the NFL for 11 years. He played with the Green Bay Packers and he played with the St. Louis Rams before they became the Los Angeles Rams. He didn't share any of that income with me, just so you know, and I hope he's watching. But the idea is this. I am a big man, and, I, and that's just who I am. Number two, I am a bald man. Okay, This is long for me. started losing my hair at the age of 16. What didn't fall out naturally, I help every Sunday and Wednesday, but when I started having children, that helped the process a whole lot more. So I'm a big man, I'm a bald man, and here's the deal. I tell them this, the third B, anybody want to guess what it is? What is it? You remember, I tell them I'm a beautiful man. That's what I tell. So you tell me what I am. Three B's are this. Number one, I am a big man. Number two, I am a number three, I am a Thank you. The only reason I lead you in that because I want you to affirm how beautiful I am. That's the only reason I say that. So it's funny that Lacey remembers that. May not remember anything I preached, Andy, but she got the three B's down. That's right. So we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. But we're going to dig into God's Word too. And I tell you this, that to me is fun. Uh, so I hope you brought your Bibles. Hope you brought an attitude that's ready to learn, a heart set that's ready to receive. And as we begin, let's go to our Father in prayer as we get into our first lesson, which is actually going to be, I think, rather uniting. But we'll see how it goes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before you today. We're grateful that you have smiled down upon us. Lord, thank you for the safety of my travel to get here. Thank you for taking care of Aaron and the kiddos while I'm away. I'm grateful for this congregation, Lord. I'm grateful for our leaders, for the ministry staff, for the deacons, for the members who want to, to serve you. They want to serve you well, and I pray, Lord, that you will use them in their context. I, I don't know what that means in totality other than as you bring people into their lives, I pray that they would respond in a manner that's faithful to your word. I pray that, Lord, that tonight, that as we study, that, that number one, I stay out of your way. Lord, please, I want this to be about you. 
pray for the families who are here. I pray for the generations who are here that, that as we read and as we filter what we hear, I pray that we will not allow, uh, we will not allow our backgrounds, we will not allow our failures, we won't even allow our successes to get in the way of, of hearing your word, receiving your word. So Lord, I do pray for the hearts and minds of those who are here, those who will listen to this online or, or however they may consume this message. Lord, I pray that you're glorified in what we're doing. Thank you for your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles up, if you will, to the book of Ephesians as we get into a subject that, that we're going to look at entitled Identity. Now, I will offer this to you that as you and I begin this particular lesson, I'm going to start a, a, with a question. And, and it's a question that actually uh, is, is addressed in the book of Ephesians. Uh, you'll, you'll understand the book of Ephesians is a six-chapter book. and It's split very evenly right down the middle if you're wanting to study it uh, from a, a, a textual study, a break in the text. Those who will, will diagram the text, they will tell you chapters 1, 2, and 3 are one section, and chapters 4, 5, and 6 are another section. Now, most of us will understand Ephesians chapters 4, 5, and 6 because that's where he gets into how the church is supposed to behave toward one another. That's where you find the unifying ones. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's where you find that in chapter 4. That's also, and we're going to dive into this a little bit, that's where you find why he gave the church prophets, why he gave them uh, teachers, why he gave them elders, uh, why he gave them evangelists. There's a, It's outlined there in chapter 4. It's, it's straight out of the text. Why did God give us these things, these positions, these individuals? Then in chapter 5 what we run into is this. How are husbands and wives supposed to respond to one another? That's the chapter that deals oftentimes when you and I think about it as husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then wives are to submit to their husbands uh, in all things as the church is to submit to Jesus Christ. Of course, in Ephesians chapter 1, there at the very end of that chapter, you're going to find out why the church is supposed to submit to Christ. is because Christ alone is the head of the church. You and I know that. We take that for granted. There's no man sitting anywhere in the world who is the singular head of the church. As a matter of fact, any man who would claim to be above Jesus I would offer something to you. You need to run and abandon that individual because Jesus is the only one who's the head of the church and therefore he is all authority, which is ironic then at the end of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is the one who says all authority has been given to me. There is no authority currently in our situation where Jesus is not in control. As a matter of fact, one day Jesus will come back. He will gather the church and he will present the church to the Father. Then he will sit down and assume the position as part of that Godhead. But until that time comes, there's no indication that he still isn't in authority. You do the text on that when the study. We don't have time to dive into all of that. But it is quite interesting. So chapter 5 is how that the relationship between husbands and wives are supposed to be according to Scripture. Chapter 6 gets into the way children are supposed to respond to their parents. And in Ephesus, they had slavery. So how were slaves supposed to respond to their slave masters? But chapter 6 is also where you find that this is where the full armor of God, the whole armor of God, is supposed to be placed on. Now that's because the battle that we are facing is not a battle of flesh and blood. If you think for one moment that the ideas that we deal with in America with moral relativism or the postmodern concept, or I'll even go as far, and I just I can't flush everything out in a series like this. I'm studying uh, critical theory right now. Uh, many of you have probably heard of critical race theory. Critical race theory is a small piece of the pie of what is called critical theory. But critical theory at its core is a destruction mentality. It exists at its basis to say anything that sets itself up as an established truth must be destroyed. So you have things like critical race theory. That's one of those that says there's a problem with the system, burn it down. But there's also what's called critical colonial theory. There's a problem with anybody setting up governments, burn them down. I personally like this one. There's one called critical fat theory. I like that one because what it says is this. I may be fat, but it's not my fault. It's your fault that I'm fat. Because, because society has placed me in a situation where, you know what, all I have to eat is McDonald's. Now, what you're going to say is this. Yeah, but you don't have to eat four Big Macs, Joe. 
That's you're only saying that though because of the position you're coming from as a skinny person who can afford to eat good food. So it's your fault that I'm fat. Therefore, you should pay. You should pay for my health care, or we're going to burn the health care system down. You look at all that and you say, Joe, are you serious? Critical theory, is that why? Yes, and here's what you need to know about critical theory. This is the extra. This is not even part of the seminar. Here, I keep pointing at Andy. I just want him to know he's getting bonus here. I want him, you know, salesman oversell. That's what I'm trying to do, right? The idea, though, with critical theory is this. Critical theory at its core will one day destroy itself. Because at the point in time I tell you that critical theory is true, it violates itself. And therefore, it has to destroy itself. That's the basis of critical theory. Now, why do I tell you all that? I tell you all that because we live in some interesting times. And even though we hear all these things that are being talked about, I want you to know something. Satan's behind every bit of it. You and I are involved in the spiritual battle. If you've ever, ever had this concept of walking around thinking that, that what you're seeing here is all that there is, then you're missing something. Because the reality is this, Satan is still actively involved. You and I are still supposed to have the armor of God on because we're still under attack. So he tells Christians throughout the New Testament to be sober-minded. Why would I need to be sober-minded? Why do I need to be clear-headed? I need to be clear-headed because there are real consequences to this. If I fail, if I fail leading my home, then it will impact Aaron. And if I fail leading my home, it will impact Colton, Michaela, Camden, and Bennett. And we're not talking about just maybe they won't get the job that they need to get, and maybe they won't like the, the sports team that they're supposed to like. We're not even talking about maybe they'll have struggles in their marriage. We're talking about if I fail in leading my home, then there are spiritual consequences to that. So I will joke about a lot of things. I will not joke about family. Because I've said this before and I'll say it again. Satan, Satan will not get my family without a fight. That's how serious I am about this. So the reality is when you and I think about what the Bible teaches, you've got to understand that in Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6, he teaches behaviors. And he tries to, to put it in the scope of this concept of when you and I think about what we're doing, we need to consider it from a spiritual standpoint. But I would offer this to you. Before he ever gets to Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6, he writes Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. And here's the way the first part of it gets to it. And I bypassed it. I don't know. I got to get excited and hit a button somehow. So let me go back. Here's the deal. Before he ever deals with how we're supposed to behave, he deals with Reminding them who they are. And I will propose something to you from a human psychology standpoint. And I believe it's not rooted in human psychology. I believe it's rooted in the text. If you don't know who you are, then your behavior is going to line up today. Because a lot of people will spend their entire life searching for validity. They will spend their entire life searching for their identity. They will spend their entire life searching for the answer to the question, who am I? And you know what they'll do is they'll root it in their jobs. They'll root it in their hobbies. They'll root it in people. That's why sometimes teenage girls give themselves physically to any boy who will say, I love you, because they are longing for an understanding of who they are. And for whatever reason, people in their life, mainly their parents and grandparents, perhaps people within the church, they've not rooted them in who they are. And so therefore their behavior is reflective of that. You see, before, before the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, ever told them how to act, he said, you need to answer the question, who are you? So let me ask you this tonight, church. Families, fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, who are you? You see, there are some of us that struggle to answer that question. And we struggle because we know our faults. If I say, who are you? Individuals will say, well, I'm a divorcee. Individuals will say, well, I'm the guy who, who couldn't pay my bills, so they uh, foreclosed on my home. That's, that, that's me. That's who I am. And I want you to hear me say this tonight. I didn't ask, what struggles have you had in your life? I asked, who are you? See, because the answer to that question 
It's not rooted in your circumstantial struggles. Some individuals will say it this way. Who are you? They'll say, I'm a widow. I'm a widower. My mother is a widower. Or a widow, excuse me. She's a widow. Dad died. Coming up on 40 years ago now of cancer. That's why, brother, I told you I'm glad you're doing well. Dad fought cancer for 15 years before we were all by his bedside singing him into his graduation. At an early age of 64, mom's a young widow. But what I want you to understand, if you identify as a widow, I want you to understand this. I didn't ask you about your marriage situation. I said, who are you? Some individuals will, will deem whether or not they're successful. Or, well, my children aren't in jail. You know, who are you? Well, I must be a successful parent. I mean, you know, they pay their taxes, at least what I know, and they've never gone to jail. I didn't ask you about your kids. I said, who are you? Well, I'm a plumber. I'm a carpenter. I'm a school teacher. I'm a business person. I didn't ask what you do for a living. I said, who are you? You see, the reason we struggle to answer that question is because many of us root our worth in our jobs or in our hobbies or in our accomplishments or we find that our failures are hard to escape. And what I want you to hear tonight is this. None of those answer the question, who are you? They merely tell me about events that have happened in your life. Because Jesus didn't die on the cross for you so that you could root yourself in temporary circumstantial situations. God didn't promise that. God didn't promise that when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, if you got an A on your test, that you're worth something. But if you got a C, you're really not worth as much or a D. God never promised you that if your boss didn't overlook you for the next raise or overlook you for the next promotion, that if your boss sees value, then you're really something. But, you know, if he didn't, then you're not. God, never, God doesn't root you in that. And you say, Joe, we know that. And I would offer this to you. I think that there are some of us who know that intellectually. You know what that means, young people? That means this, we can answer a Bible Bowl quiz and we can give the right answer. But some of us in our lives, we have not accepted what we intellectually know. That's why some of you have struggled to forgive yourself for the sins of your past. You intellectually know that God has forgiven you. But you are not assuming that forgiveness. You know that there are events that occur in life that you didn't plan for and that happened to you. You know it's not your fault. But emotionally, you're still struggling with that. So where's the answer? The answer, I firmly believe, is in what the Apostle Paul did here in the, the, the book of Ephesians when it came to who they were. Now, I'm going to go ahead and fast forward that one slide because you've already seen it, but I want you to know in chapters 1, chapters 2, and chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's really defining the Jews and the Gentiles within the church there as the one new man. As a matter of fact, if you were to kind of highlight a quick breakdown in your notes, I would tell you chapters 1, 2, and 3 are about the one new man. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are the way that the one new man is supposed to act. You say, Joe, where does that come from in the Scriptures? Well, when I look over at Ephesians chapter 2, specifically verse 14, the text reads this way, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into what, church? Some of your translations will say one. New American Standard says one new man, thus establishing peace. What's that mean? That means through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the cross, Gentiles are no longer excluded from being God's covenant people. But Jews, just because of their background, they're not included just because they had the right lineage. The idea is this. The key is the cross of Christ. Because I would propose this to you. The cross of Christ makes all the difference in your life. It really is that big a deal. You see, because as you read through this, he's going to remind them of who they used to be. I want you to look over chapter 2, verse 1, and read with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible reads this way, and you were dead. Listen to their identity. Listen to who they used to be. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among them, and look, he changes. For those of you who love deep Bible study, you'll notice that there's a change in, in the subject, the pronoun. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it's all about you. Chapter 2, verse 3, he says, among them we, we, he includes himself in that writing, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Did you catch that? He says, your identity at one time, your past, you were dead. At one point in time in your past, you walked according to the course of the world. At one point in time in the past, you were working, you were walking uh, in the same way as the sons of disobedience. He says, at one time in the past, we were living according to the last lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. He goes into this idea, we're by nature children of wrath. The concept behind that is not you are born a child of wrath. It is that behavior comes forth and demonstrates itself into that category as being one who deserves wrath. But here's some sweet, sweet words. I want you to look at the beginning of verse 4. Because the beginning of verse 4, I would offer this to you. There's some of the sweetest words in all of the New Testament where the Bible says, but God. See, that's who you used to be. But God. That's, who you, that's who, how you used to live. But God. You see, when you drop down, you'll also see other descriptions here. Verse 11, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, verse 12, remember that you were at that time, listen to these descriptions, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no and without God in the world. But look, verse 13 begins with the sweet, sweet words, but now in Christ Jesus. That's who you used to be. The reason I tell you that those are some of the sweetest phrases of all the New Testament is because the word but is a contrast word. It shows that there is a, something that's different. It's not what it used to be. As a matter of fact, I, I went into and looked up the Greek here from the standpoint of verses 11 through, uh, or in 12, right, 11 and 12, dealing with the concept of what does it mean to be separate? What does it mean to be excluded? Here's what it means. Separate is literally without Christ. You have no national hope of the Messiah. Excluded means you're estranged, you're alienated from citizenship of God's covenant people. Strangers means you're foreigners. You have no access to the arrangements of the promises of God in that sense of the covenant people. Having no hope, it means you have no expectation of future glory. Without God, it means you're godless. Formerly were far off to know it's a great distance between the Gentiles and God. But now. But now things are different. You see, what's beautiful is, and you see here on the screen, that if you keep reading in chapter 2 over verse 19, the Bible says this, So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. I love the way that the book of Ephesians describes the church. I love the church. I, I really do. I, I love the church. One of the, the things, I, I, I love being with God's people. I love the organization of the church. I love the stability of the church. You say stability, it seems like we're we're so frail and feeble. Let me tell you something. The church isn't frail and feeble. Individual people are, but the church is solid. I love the church. I love the fact that the Bible refers to the church in Ephesians chapter 1 as the body of Christ. I love the fact that the, the Bible here in Ephesians chapter 2 describes the church as God's household. You know, I have a household. You have a household, right? If I were to say who's in your household, chances are you probably give me your spouse, your your children. I don't know if there's a maybe a, a grandparent who's living with you or a great grandparent, but you would you would be able to answer the question: Who's in your house? Who's a part of your household? And then you would understand what that means as far as the unique relationship that is enjoyed within that setting versus maybe your next door neighbor. You know, I, I, I like one of my next door neighbors. 
and, and it's funny because I never thought that this would be the guy. Um, you know, and he, it's funny because uh, one day he asked me a question. I was pulling a suitcase out to the car, and uh, he asked me, his name is Joe as well. He said, Joe, I've never asked you what you do for a living. I said, oh, I'm a minister. He says, great, been cussing the whole time in front of a preacher. I said, Joe, the fact that you couldn't tell that tells me I wasn't flaunting it in front of you, and I appreciate that. I said, if I can ever sit down with you and Miss Lucy, I would love the opportunity to talk with you. If you ever have any questions about eternity or, or, or the Bible or about the church, I would love the opportunity. Here's why I never anticipated it. Joe's a construction worker, and just about every other word that comes out of his mouth is a cuss word. Joe doesn't walk around trying to offend you. You ever met somebody that it literally was just a part of their vernacular? That's Joe. He'll give you the shirt off his back. He's numerous times said, if you need to borrow my lawnmower, come get it. He actually, I, my shed doors were so uh, decaying because I'm cheap and I bought a shed at an auction that already had some water damage. And my mind was, well, I can replace that wood. Well, finally, the door brought it all at the bottom and I was worried that critters were going to get in. I had gone to Lowe's and I had priced out big sheets of wood. You know how big, how much that cost? So in my mind, I'm going, how can I make fence, you know, these $3 fence posts, uh, how can I put that together to make that work for a door? Well, Joe being in construction, he was, Huey and I were talking about it. He goes, I can take care of that. Joe brought me two big old sheets, three-quarter thick, three-quarter inch thick from a construction site that was leftovers that they were just going to get rid of, and two or three two-by-fours. I'm going to tell you, Joe will give you the shirt off his back. But I never thought I was going to be, you know, kind of friends with him. Honestly, Aaron and I had a talk of, should we let our children outside, you know, because he's going to be cussing around them. I don't know. He and Lucy turned out to be some of the nicest people. Now, that doesn't mean that they that he's cleaned all that up. But here's why I tell you about my next door neighbor. It's because I know what my household is. I can tell you their names. I can tell you their interest. I know my neighbor, but my neighbor's not in my household. You understand the difference? If you understand the difference, then I want this text to permeate your very soul and mind tonight. Because when you were redeemed, when you were saved, you weren't saved into just nothing. You were added to the household of God. Means you're not just a you're not a next door neighbor. You're in the house. Now here, here's the deal, though. I, I want you to understand before he ever gets to that point in chapter two, he'll start chapter one. You can't you can't build up and just bypass chapter one. And and you know, I guess I could create a whole lesson out of chapter two. I Maybe mean, it's there. I could offer an invitation right now. I guess are you a part of the household of God? And we could have a song, and then you know there we go. But the idea is this. I want to drive home who you are. I don't want to just give you a concept. I want to give you an answer. And I want to show you within the scripture that tonight when you leave here, that you can leave knowing how to answer the question, who am I? And here's the deal. In chapter 1, you'll see a repetitive phrase or a concept over and over and over again. And that repetitive phrase, that repetitive concept is the, the phrase, in him, in Christ Jesus, through Christ, through Jesus. I want you to see this with me. Look, if you will, over at chapter 1. Because you're going to read it numerous times. Beginning with verse 3, the Bible says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him, in love He predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to his kind intention of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to his riches of his grace. Verse 8, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. You'll see that concept just for the sake of time in verse 10. 
You'll see it in verse 11. You'll see it in verse 13. You'll see it numerous times. Over and over again, the concept of in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Now, here's what I want to drive home tonight. I want you to know something tonight. I don't know everybody's situation here, but I want to love you enough to be blunt with you. If you are not in Christ, you don't have the blessings that we just read of in Ephesians chapter 1. It's as blunt as I can possibly be. You want to know where God's grace is found? In Christ. You want to know where the blessings are found? In Christ. You want to know where the hope is found? In Christ. And if you're not in Christ, then you don't have any of that. But the good news is this, you can have it. It's like he's given you a gift. He's put a gift out before you and he says, here, just take it. Just take it. He says, here's how you take it. You'll, you submit your will to my will. You, you confess Jesus as Lord. You quit being Lord of your life. Let Jesus be Lord of your life. You are baptized after repenting. You, you change your mind. Results in a change of action. Repent. And then you're immersed through the forgiveness of your sins. Resurrecting the walk in newness of life. In so doing, you will accept the gift of being in Christ. And thus all that it entails. You see, I recognize tonight on a Friday night, most of us have already done that. Most of us have. So what I want you to hear in all of this is that in Christ, he lays out in chapter one who you are. Now, before we go, though, I've got to, I've got to shut a door that is opened and I don't have time to shut it in every way, but I will try it this way, okay? The door that I want to shut is in verse four and five where the Bible says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intentions of his will. Now, here's the door that I want to shut. We don't have time to discuss every aspect of predestination. I just don't have time. You could create an entire quarterly class on that and I'd probably still not touch every aspect of predestination. But I do want you to consider this at a very basic elementary level. Do I believe in biblical predestination? The answer is yes. Do I believe in denominational predestination? The answer is no. What's the difference? Denominational predestination says that before you were born, God predetermined who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. I want you to imagine in some of the hospital labor and delivery wards, probably here in Houston, uh, there were babies that were born today, and if your hospitals are like our hospitals, on that particular floor, when a baby is born, there is a bell that dings or some type of chime that goes off, maybe a lullaby, right? And I didn't know what that meant until as a preacher, I'm showing up going, wait, on floor number three, there's no lullaby. But on floor number two, it's like a lullaby is happening every 30 minutes. And somebody says, well, that's because when a baby is born, that's when we play that music, right? Denoting that a child has been born. Well, here's the way that pre uh, denominational predestination works. Every time that place, right? The reality is this. God had already predetermined whether that child would go to heaven or hell. Before the child ever did anything. Before the child had opportunity to sin. Because he, he picks and chooses who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. So it would look like you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, and I'm going to hell. And you look at that and you say, well, what did I do? And the answer is nothing. God predetermined that you're going to hell, Job. You say, that's not fair. Don't say that God's not fair. God is just. You say, well, wait a second, Joe, you're preaching the gospel today. Oh, yeah, but don't worry. Pre, uh, denominational predestination says this, that even though I may be preaching the gospel today and I have obeyed the gospel because God predetermined my destiny, my eternal home has already been predetermined to be hell. Don't worry, I'll fall away before I die. And even though there could be a drug dealer out on the street right now, if God has predetermined that that individual is going to go to heaven, don't worry, before that drug dealer dies, he or she will obey the gospel and they will be saved. Because God's predetermined it. You say, well, Joe, that just takes man's, man's choice out of it. Well, here's what I want you to understand. You think you have the power to thwart the will of God? You see, denominational predestination says this. You don't have the power to thwart the will of God. So if he's already predetermined that you're going to heaven, then really, you can't do anything to mess that up. But if he's already predetermined that you're going to hell, 
You can't do anything to help that. And so here's the way that denominational predestination works. For God so loved, John chapter 3, right? John chapter 3, verse 16. Quote it with me. For God so loved only those whom he predestined to go to heaven, that whosoever, no, not whosoever, that doesn't work, that only those who be predestined to go to heaven uh, would believe in him and not perish but have everlasting life. Is that the way the text reads for you? No, it doesn't. For God so loved whom? The world. Is the world all encompassing? Absolutely is. That whosoever believeth in him, right? Not just those who be pre predetermined and preselected. Or what about this one as the Apostle Peter was writing? For God is not willing that those who be predetermined to go to heaven should perish, but that they should have everlasting life. Is that the way your text reads? No, my Bible says this. For God is not willing that any, any should perish. That's all encompassing. So I do not believe in denominational predestination. Some of you are looking at going, Joe, that's a very simplified view. You're right. That I, I don't have time to dive into it. You feel free to do so after I get on my airplane and leave. But here's the deal. I do believe in biblical predestination. Well, what's biblical predestination? Before the foundation of the world, God knew that mankind needed a Savior. That we were going to blow it. And so before the foundation of the world, there was a plan that was set forth that Jesus would come and die on the cross and be resurrected on the third day and that there would be a gospel message that would be proclaimed and all of those who would faithfully come to him out of obedience to the way that God would have it to be, that all of those individuals would receive the forgiveness of their sin, thus being added to the household of God, thus having their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That was predetermined that all of those who would respond to the gospel, that they would be in the elect. So did... Did God predestine? Yes. He didn't predestine individuals. He predestined a plan and the individuals who would respond to that plan. Now here's the way I wanted to close that door because the Bible says that before the foundation of the world, he chose us, right? Verse 4, and that he predestined us. So I want you to understand the difference there between what we hear in the denominational world and what the Bible teaches in the most simple form. You can say you believe in biblical predestination. It is, it's okay. Just be ready to explain that to people, right? So here's the deal, though. What I want you to understand is this. There are three words that come out of this that I would tell you are the answer to the question, who am I? Those words, if you're writing them down, come from verse 4, verse 5, and verse 7. And here are the three words. Number one, if you want to answer the question, who am I? I am chosen. Number two, verse 5, who am I? I am adopted. Number three, who am I? Verse seven, I am redeemed. Now here's the reality. You and I, we read those through American eyes and ears through our experiences. You heard me mention that we have all have a filter. Well, we hear those words, chosen, adopted, and redeemed through a filter. I, I've never been adopted in the sense of a physical adoption. Some of you may have. I, I don't know. It's the privilege of being a guest speaker. I don't know everybody's situation in here. I do know that my youngest brother, the one who played football, he and his wife adopted three children from Uganda. So we actually have two nephews and a niece who were born in Uganda who are now a part of our uh, my extended family. There were two, two nephews and one niece. Now here's the deal. I saw pictures of, of what took place. I didn't go to Uganda and go through that process with them. Uh, I saw my sister-in-law uh, washing clothes out in a bathtub because they didn't have the washers and dryers. I saw my, my nephews and my niece. They were playing at the orphanage where they were living and they didn't have shoes on and they their conditions weren't on a playground like American kids are used to. I, I know they told me their ration of food was basically a bowl of rice a day. That's, that's what they ate. Um, situation that occurred, there were some deaths of their biological parents. They were being raised by extended family, and there were so many children in that family that they could not provide for all of them. So my younger brother and his wife went over there to adopt the two boys, and then while they were over there, the uncle who was raising Caroline at the time, she was five, said, this is a sister of one of the boys, would you adopt her as well? I can imagine the heart, that was difficult on that uncle. But the reality was that he knew that there was something better for that child that he couldn't provide. Now here's the deal. I've never been adopted. But if you hear the words that you're adopted, you process that through your filters. 
If you hear the concept of you're chosen and you've ever been in a situation where you were isolated and the people didn't call your name to be on their team, then you understand the hurt of not being chosen and the feeling of satisfaction of being chosen. But here's what I want you to understand. The church at Ephesus didn't process that through their American ears. They would have processed it through their ears. And so I want you for just a moment to go back in time, try to, to Ephesus. Ephesus was a thriving city. It had a seaport. It had a lot of commerce, a lot of trade, a lot of sharing and exchanging of ideas. You can actually get online today at dads, grandparents, moms, if you want to take your children. I would always encourage when you go to the internet, be cautious of everything, but I think it might be wise when you study the Bible to say, hey, let's look at some ancient artifacts from Ephesus. You can get online right now and see that they've got archaeological dig sites in Ephesus that they put canopies over because the mosaic tiles are so beautiful and well preserved that it gives you an indication that people who lived in ancient Ephesus, they weren't some people from the hills and from the sticks. Uh, these individuals were very modern for their time. As a matter of fact, in Ephesus, they actually had indoor cooling. Um, it's funny because we're here in Texas and we've talked about the Pecos River family encampment. Uh, but that was the first time I really appreciated swamp cooler technology. I know that maybe y'all have dealt with that, but that was my first time really appreciating the concept of colder air passing water through it and it picking up the cold evaporated water and it makes your room a little colder. Well, in ancient Ephesus, they had tunnels that were dug underneath these houses, underneath the streets, and they had water that would run underneath. See, they figured something out. Underneath the earth's surface at a certain depth, it is a consistent cooler temperature. You put water through there and then in your home, you have an opening from that tunnel into your home. What happens is that cool air that has the cooler water evaporates into your home and it actually can cool down your home. In ancient Ephesus, they figured that out. Now, while they may have done a lot of good things in ancient Ephesus as far as advancements and theories and ideas, not everything was great. It's kind of like America. Kind of like America. We got a lot of positives, but we got some negatives. One of their negatives is one of our negatives. I did some research on this one because I, I wanted to know, and I, I went back as far as I could to the time period as close to the Apostle Paul writing as possible. And I want to be fair and honest with my research. It's still separated by some years. But in reflecting of what was going on in Ephesus regarding the way they viewed children, you can actually find some uh, historical documents written by gynecologists or OBGYNs at that time. Those who delivered the children cared for the women. You can go back and read all of that, kind of their ways, right? And here's one of the things that I found out. Children weren't looked at in ancient Ephesus the same way that they're looked at in some parts of America. As a matter of fact, uh, well, no, maybe I should rephrase that. Maybe they are. Here's what I mean. In America, we have safe drop places. If a parent has a child, but they don't uh, feel they can provide for that child. Uh, I know where we come from, fire stations are places that if a young mother is going to uh, decide that she needs to give that child up for adoption, that, that she can take that child to a fire station and no questions are asked that that, that is a safe place to leave her child. Um, to, to the other side of that, and I hate to say it's quite funny because it may not be funny, it kind of makes a statement. There was a mother who actually faced legal charges because she tried to drop her teenage girl off at a fire station one time, and they said, no, you can't do that. Uh, but there are other places in America where that can take place. In ancient Ephesus, they didn't have soft, uh, safe drop spots. As a matter of fact, what I read, my research showed that in ancient Ephesus, if a child was, was born... And, they didn't know if that child was going to be male or female, if they were going to have any deformations or anything along those lines. The child was presented to the father. And in that home, the father was the one who made the determination as to whether the child stayed or didn't stay. And so the mother didn't have that choice. They, this was not an Americanized view of women. And so when they brought that child to the husband, if the husband said, no, that child cannot stay in this home, well, the child had to go somewhere. And so the research that I saw showed this, that they didn't have the orphanage concept that we have today. Oh, there were orphans. Don't get me wrong. In the book of James, we'll talk about pure and undefiled religion. But don't think for one moment there's an orphanage somewhere that is providing a bowl of rice. 
Rather, it would more likely be that our children who are roaming the streets. And if you want to care for orphans, then care for the street children. You see, there are some cultures in the world today that don't have American concepts of orphanages. Those children, if they're kicked out, they're on the street. So here's what took place in ancient Ephesus because a small child can't fend for themselves. There was literally a discard pile outside of the main city in the wilderness. The child would be left to the elements until they would eventually succumb to the heat or there was a wild animal who would come and deal with them or something along those lines. But it has been said before that if you were walking through Ephesus that you at times could actually hear children who were in the wilderness or right outside the city crying. And here's the, the culture of the time. You, you could go and select a child off the discard pile. You could raise that child to be your slave if you wanted to. I mean, you were the one that was going to be providing for them. You could raise that child to be your slave or you could raise that child to be one of your own. When ancient Ephesus hears that I've been chosen, I want you to understand what that means. We're not talking about a game of Red Rover, Red Rover, send Big O Joe over. We're talking about my sin put me on the discard pile. And through Jesus, I have been chosen. But I wasn't chosen to be a servant. You see, because the next word there says that I've been adopted. Do you recognize that when you were saved, you were not brought into the house of God and Him say, oh good, now I have another servant, go get me a drink. Oh good, I have a servant, go get me a fan and just fan me the whole time. The Bible says that when you and I were redeemed, that we were brought into the household of God. You realize that you've been adopted as one of His children. You enter into slavery to him as a bond servant by choice. Free will. Bond servants were individuals that made a choice. They were not individuals born into slavery. They were individuals who allowed themselves to become slaves. You've heard the song, and I know Andy sung it, or y'all sung it around here, the song Pierce My Ear. The idea of piercing of the ear was a free willing Marking, and I hate to even use it this way, but some of you have seen piercing of the ear in cattle where the, the, the tag is placed within the ear. Well, that tag represents ownership. That tag represents, at times, various things. It could represent fertility or any number of things, inoculations. But in this illustration, it represents ownership. Okay? So here's the deal. You're adopted as his child. You free willingly you free willingly say, pierce my ear because I want to spend the rest of my life serving you. I think sometimes our belief is that when I was saved, I was saved and therefore I immediately became a servant. And I need you to hear how that process works according to Scripture. How can I, how can I rectify the concept of I'm a child but I'm also a servant? And here's the biblical model. You were adopted as a child you free willingly enter into servitude. Now you free willingly entered into his family when you obeyed the gospel. But the language of the text doesn't say that you came in as only a servant. You came in as his child. I am chosen. Who am I? I'm chosen. Who am I? I'm adopted. Who am I? I'm redeemed. And here's what that means. I told you chapter 6 says they had slaves. And they did. They, they weren't perfect. We, weren't, we aren't perfect. But they did have slavery in that culture. It was not an uncommon thing. And it wasn't always something. You need to hear me say this. It wasn't something that was based upon colors of skin. Uh, you had people with the same colors of skin back then that were over, overthrowing people. And if they could capture people, they would enter them into to servitude as slaves. Um, it wasn't our concept, so I need you to detach our filter from this for a second. I just need you to hear this, that if you were walking through the streets of Ephesus, you would eventually, as you pass through maybe the meat, you pass through the fine linen, 
you would eventually hear a slave trader, an auctioneer, calling out numbers for people to buy an individual who's standing on a slave block. And I want you to picture this image. Satan is the auctioneer. You are the one who's on the slave block. God walks up and says, I want that one. And Satan says, you don't want that one. That one right there, they didn't care about you. As a matter of fact, you don't want them because they've lived a life that is opposite of what you want. And God says, I want that one and I'm willing to pay full asking price. Which, by the way, full asking price at that time for a slave was 30 pieces of silver. How much money did Judas get when he betrayed Jesus? 30 pieces of silver. Isn't that interesting? The amount that is recorded in Scripture, Judas entered into, he was bought for full price of a slave. But the idea behind this is, he says, I'll give full asking price. Satan goes, full asking price. Don't you see them? Don't you know their heart? Don't you know their mind? And God stops. God stops Satan right there in this auction moment. He says, I will pay beyond full asking price. I will pay with the blood of my son. God exchanges. You step off the auction board. And you leave with God. I don't know. I don't know how you value things. You know, my children don't value things the way that I value them. If they get, if they get any amount of money, especially my little boys, my daughter, she doesn't know how to spend money. She make a wonderful wife one day. She knows how to bake and cook and run a house, but she doesn't spend money. Wonderful. There's, but I say she can't date until she's 30, and there's been no man born that's worth her hand save for Jesus Christ. So she's got a lot of... I pity the guy who comes into our home and says he wants to date my daughter. But either way, if she thinks he's okay, we'll see. We'll give him a chance, right? But either way, it's this, that my boys, the 13-year-old and the 11-year-old, as soon as they get money, and it's like it's on fire. You've, you've seen kids like that. So we're trying to teach good money management of, hey, if you just hold on to it, Maybe you can buy something that's actually more. And we do. We teach financial management. We, we, we do the practice of they've got to save so much, they've got to give so much, and then they can spend. Uh, but we do put it into categories. Uh, but here's the deal. Dollar Tree is the downfall of my children. Those toys that break and you know, they get tired of before the end of the day, that's where their money goes. They value. If they have money, they value that cheap toy. I don't. I spend my money in other places, but I'm sure at times it may be a frivolous concept. So I, I really don't know what I spend it on. Probably apps. You know, if I come across an app and it's 99 cents or something, I'll buy an app or something like that. But either way, I don't know how you value things. I do know this. I don't know of a single thing or a single person in this world that I would allow for one of my children to be completely bled out for another person to be benefited. I, I, I've never been in the situation, I, I pray that I'm never in the situation where I have to decide about organ donations and things along those lines if a child were to die. Or to... In that case, I know some people have and there have been lives that have been spared, I get that, but we're not talking about an organ donation, we're talking about a completely healthy individual that they are allowed to be bled out totally so that somebody else could receive a benefit. And yet that's exactly what God did for you when he bought you off of the slave block. And so you step down off that block and you walk with him as a redeemed individual. Let me tell you something. You and I, we don't try to buy junk I would offer this, God doesn't spend the blood of his son on junk. You are valuable. You are more valuable than your past. You are more valuable than your failures. You are more valuable than your successes. God doesn't spend the blood of his son on junk. And yet the Bible says, you and I are chosen we are adopted and we are redeemed. I love this particular song. I know you've sung Just As I Am and you probably have seen this bridge. I'm sure it's been sung here. But I love it because it talks about the reality of 
It's okay. It's not that God smiles on individuals who've chosen to live rebellious. But what I want you to hear is this. Your past doesn't have to dictate your future. Because the sweet phrase, but God, and but now in Christ Jesus. This particular bridge says, I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I want you to see what you bring to the table. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And here's his response. You bring nothing to the table but hurt, pain, and need. And the Bible says this, or this particular song, and it's echoed in the text. He says, and I'm welcome with open arms. Praise God. Just as I am. Why do I tell you that? Because I will say this again. There are some of us even coming here tonight that you've been struggling with the answer of who are you. You may not even have known you've struggled with that. Probably you've struggled with it for such a long time it's just become a part of who you are. You feel like you're not doing enough. You feel like you're not good enough. You feel like your failures will always haunt you. Your past will never be something that you can escape. You feel like you may be failed with your children or maybe you are failing with your children. You feel like you don't pray enough. You feel like you don't study enough. You might even feel like you're not devoted enough. But either way, all of that is rooted on what you bring to the table. And I'm offering something to you tonight. And that is this. You bring nothing to the table that deserves being chosen, adopted, and redeemed. And yet the Bible still says that He loves you. You see, what's beautiful, what's beautiful is this. That you and I, as children of God, we wear jerseys. If you'll allow me to use this illustration. Not fans. It's an illustration that makes sense with me. I grew up playing sports. Here's the illustration. I don't know why it is when you're an away team at a football game, you always wear the lighter colored jerseys. I, I, I think it's because dark makes you look big and, and scary, and white makes you look like a fairy. I was a pretty chunky fairy. That's all I'm going to say if that's be the case. But the idea behind that is this. I remember what it was to leave our high school on a Friday, get on a school bus, and drive to another town. I remember what it was that people in the other town were so willing to welcome us that they, some of them, probably some high school students, made posters for us and stapled them to, to light poles along the way that said something along the lines of, you're about to get your lunch handed to you. Uh, you may walk over here, but you're going to limp back. You know, stuff like that, right? And I remember what it was to pull up to the visiting, to the, to the football field when you weren't the home team. And I remember what it was to be ridiculed by, again, high school kids who were grilling hot dogs and hamburgers in the parking lot as they talked about us. They talked bad about my mom. I said, you don't even know my mom. And then they talked bad about my dad. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, but who kicked off? He said, I didn't say that. But the idea is this. Yeah, you just were jawing because they were trying to get in your head. And then I remember what it was to go into the locker room as you hear the band start to play and the noise of the crowd. And you're putting on those light colored jerseys that are going to stand out as, and here's what they're going to say, you're not from here, are you? And I remember what it was to see those guys putting that show, those shoulder pads on, the jerseys on, grabbing their helmets. And before we left, I do remember looking at them and it was almost a sense of, you and I are wearing the same jersey. We're about to walk into a hostile environment. But I know this much. You got my back, and I got your back, and we're about to go to war for one another. You may look at that and go, Joe, it's a high school game. Oh, I know it is, but the mentality is we're about to become gladiators because everybody else in the fan in the stands are going to cheer when somebody gets their head knocked off. Right? Oh, that was such a great hit. And the guy's like, I can't see. Coach, you do it again. You know, the idea, though, is this. When you open the door from the locker room, that's when the real boos and hisses come out. And you ever seen guys put their arms together and they loop their arms together as they walk to the field together? It really is a, a sense of togetherness, but it's a sense of this. We are foreigners on somebody else's field. We wear the same jersey. So that means this. I got your back, and you got mine. And when you go out on that field, you know what you'll do? 
You'll extend every bit of your energy, even through pain, to help that guy right beside you. Can I kindly remind you, as a child of God, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. Your treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. In other words, you are the visiting football team on somebody else's turf. And here's what I want you to know. Because of Jesus Christ, because of what God has done in choosing, adopting, and redeeming, those of us who are Christians, I want you to know something tonight as you look around this room, this congregation, you even look at this old boy that you didn't know before this weekend, and I want you to know something. You and I are wearing the same jersey. You know what that means? That means I'm for you. And I have your back. And you have mine and you're for me. Because our identity is unique as children of God. You know why? Because not everybody in the world can claim chosen, adopted, and redeemed. But you and I tonight, we walk arm in arm. Now, what does that mean in the totality of this? This whole seminar set is dealing with the church and the family. Before we go anywhere else, I need to establish something within your life personally and within the life of the community of the church, this congregation, and that is this. Individually tonight, when you lay your head down on your pillow, I want you to know something. God doesn't see you for your failures. God says you are chosen, adopted, and redeemed. Next time somebody asks who you are, don't describe yourself by your job. That's not who you are. That's what you do. You are chosen, adopted, and redeemed. You are not your failures. You are not your successes. Because none of who you are is rooted in temporary circumstances. Young children, I wish you would pay attention to this. Because teenagers through their adolescent years are on a search for identity. That's why some of them color their hair all weird colors and wear all kinds of weird clothes. They listen to music this, this way this week. Next week they'll listen to a different kind of music. You know why? It's because for them they're playing a role and they're trying to figure out what role fits them. And it's a time of exploration. It really is. And I want you to hear me say this, young people. You are not rooted in other people's affirmation. You are not rooted in whether or not they like you. Your identity is established when you become a Christian. Because the Bible says when that occurs, you are chosen, adopted, and redeemed. That is who you are. And you know what? If you never get that great job, you never get that great scholarship, nobody likes you, which I doubt that. I'm seeing some of you right now. I know they're going to like you. I see your smiles. It's okay. Because God says you were worth and you are worth the blood of my son. Your value is so high. But here's what I want you to understand collectively as a community. Because we have this identity, you and I wear the same jerseys. How does a football team operate if half the football team's functioning one way and the other half is functioning another way? Tell me how many games that team's going to win. Probably none. What's going to happen if, if the coach is telling the team to do something but other people within the team are telling them to do something else? How's that, how's that team going to go? They're going to run a lot of burpees and do a lot of burpees on Monday with they're in the So here's the deal. Who's the coach? Somebody tell me, who's the coach of the church? Say it again. I, I, I don't know if everybody heard that. Who's the coach? God, specifically Jesus, he's the head. Ephesians chapter 1, correct? So that's why I started this seminar with this. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about him. But tonight, I need you to understand, you and I wear the jersey because we're a part of the body of Christ. I pray that gives you encouragement tonight. I pray that lifts you up, builds you up. I pray that it may answer a question in your life that maybe you've been wondering this whole time. I don't know how to answer the question. Who am I? I will say this. You are more than what you think because of Jesus Christ. Let's go to our Father in prayer. I'd love to chat with you more if you'd like to. But uh, 
No, no, I'm going to leave that there. I want that to marinate in your minds tonight. Because everything that we're going to do from this point on, it stems off of understanding who you are. I, I showed you through the text, Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6. Before I can tell you what to do, I need to remind you who you are. That's a biblical concept. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful that you love us. We're grateful that you don't give up on us. Thank you for seeing a value in us that we struggle to see within ourselves. Lord, we know our past, but sometimes we forget that you do too. Lord, we know our failures, and there are many individuals in this room, even husbands, who uh, quite possibly in the darkness of their own, own house, their own room, that they know that maybe they're not leading their homes the way that they need to be leading their homes. Lord, I pray for those men. Pray for all of us. It seems like it, sometimes we do great, then sometimes we slack off. So Lord, I pray that we would understand that Satan doesn't take a break. And we can't either. Our break will be when we breathe our last on this earth. Well, there are some ladies here who have sought, and not necessarily intentionally, but their value has come so much from things that are temporary and circumstantial. Heavenly Father, I pray that you help my sisters understand that they're more than what their physical bodies look like. Even though this world says that's the that's the basis of the value of, of ladies, I pray that they understand that they're more than what their house looks like. Some individuals have so much pressure and stress, Lord, that they exist under, and some of that's put on by society and some of that's put on by them. Lord, I pray for my sisters that they would know peace. I pray that they would understand leadership in a, an appropriate, God-honoring manner and that they would be active about that. Lord, I pray that you would be with them tonight. Lord, I pray for grandparents. I pray for aunts and uncles, those here who would be in what we call the extended family category. Please help them to understand their job's not done at home. And your Father, you made it very clear that uh, that there was supposed to be generational teaching that goes on, generational faithfulness within the families. And I pray that grandparents, uh, they would understand their value. And I pray that grandchildren would understand the value of their grandparents. Thank you for the church. Thank you for this congregation and all the congregations that are represented, Lord. I pray that, that we would come to appreciate the church, love the church so much more. And I pray that we would lift the arms up of our elders. And we would support the works in an appropriate manner and that the church would lift the arms of the fathers and the mothers and support the work of the home. And, and Lord, I pray that in all of this, you're glorified. We, we want to be glorifying to you. And so, Lord, tonight, our prayer is, is simply this. As we reflect on who we are, Lord, help us to never forget the value that you have placed within us, the value that you see. And I pray that we, we're settled in how to answer that question. Who are we? Thank you for the opportunity to call you Father. Thank you for the fact that you've added us to your household, good Lord. I pray if there are those here tonight that do not know you through your son, they've never entered into covenant with you. Lord, I pray that if they are young people, they will ask their parents. I pray that their fathers will study with them, their mothers will study with them. I pray uh, that if that be the situation, that maybe there's not a mother, father, or one or the other, I pray that there's a mentor in their life they may be able to go to as well. Lord, I pray that that they will come to know you in a covenant manner. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.